بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق الله أجمعين وعلى آله وأصحابه وأتباعه أجمعين رب يسر وأعين يا كريم وافتح بالحق إنك الفتاح العليم Welcome to uh, everybody in the Cambridge New Muslims group and welcome to those who are also following on the internet, insha'Allah. This will be the second in our planned four lectures on the Khulafa Rashidun, the first four caliphs or successors to the authority of uh, uh, the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And last time we were looking at the short but amazing caliphate of Abu Bakr, a Siddiq, and we took the story up to his death only two years after assuming the supreme office in the new city-state of Medina. And we saw uh, the challenges that he faced and the way in which he, despite his gentle temperament, successfully reunited Arabia in the face of a succession of rebellions. We're going to take up the story from uh, that point, but rewinding first of all in order to trace the, as it were, pre-Khilafa story of uh, Sidna Omar, uh, to know how the man was shaped uh, and to learn what kind of factors were at work in creating this extraordinary individual, this person who uh, really was one of the perhaps four or five influential uh, political and religious leaders in world history. Uh, his name was Omar ibn al-Khattab ibn Nufayl ibn Abd al-Uzza and he was from the Quraysh tribe and from the Bani Adi which was one of the uh, branches of the tribe of Quraysh so he's from Mecca and he's related somewhat distantly to the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we know quite a bit about his family and some of his offspring actually become quite significant in the early history of Islam from his first wife, Zainab bin Maz'un, he has Abdullah, who is perhaps his best-known son, known as Akhul Layl, the brother of the night, because following instructions from the Holy Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abdullah bin Omar became particularly uh, famous for his fondness for the tahajjud, the night prayer, but also somebody who is uh, an expert in hadith, narrating hadith, and people travel to Medina to seek his uh, Fatwa, and it is through him in particular and through other Sahabas that the fiqh of Omar starts to develop in particular and in a sense you could say that the fiqh of, of, of Imam Malik and of the Maliki Madhab is al-fiqh al-Omari because so much of his fatwa and his particular orientation in uh, transmission of hadith and also in, in, in fatwa is, uh, some, is something that comes from the, the second of the, the Khulafa. Um, there are other sons by Zainab, there's Abdurrahman, and there's also Hafsa, his uh, famous daughter, who becomes particularly well-known, as we'll see as we get into the story, as one of the wives of the Holy Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he also becomes the father-in-law of the Prophet. And then another wife, Umm Kulthum, uh, is significant because she is the daughter of, of, of Hazrat Ali ibn Abi Talib. Uh, so Fatima becomes uh, Hazrat Omar's uh, mother-in-law. There's a particularly close relationship between the two men, as is instanced by the fact that uh, Hazrat Ali entrusts his daughter to, uh, to Hazrat Omar. And they have uh, a number of, of offspring, including Zaid and Ruqayya, who go on to play their own particular role. Uh, we know quite a bit about him, and particularly about who, what he looked like, because he was a very formidable person of the four uh, early Khalifas, and each one represents a particular form of, of, of human virile possibility. Uh, he was the one who was the most formidable, and some people are frankly afraid of him. Uh, he was very tall, walked with a slight stoop, so tall and so strong that he was one of those semi-legendary characters who could actually jump onto a horse. He didn't need to hoist himself up on a stirrup, he could just grab onto the horse's neck and, and, and pull himself up. Uh, he walked very fast. Uh, people say, Sarak uh, Rakib. he used to walk like a mounted man. Uh, he had a pale face, he was uh, balding, uh, very humble, as we'll see later, um, famous for this. Um, used to walk uh, barefoot in the city of Medina very often. Um, and uh, a great horseman, not only could he uh, jump on a horse, but 
people used to say, and the Arabs respected uh, furusiya, horsemanship, they used to uh, admire uh, Hazrat Omar in his style of, of, of riding and his mastery of, 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 of the horse. Uh, he converts six years into the beginning of, of Islam, the sixth year of the, of the Nubuwa, uh, when he was himself um, 26. And this seems to have been the consequence of a, of a du'a, of a prayer but of the Holy Prophet himself. Uh, Omar was uh, an enemy of the Prophet and an enemy of Islam in his pagan times and used to persecute the Muslims. وكان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول اللهم أعز الإسلام بعمر ابن الخطاب أو عمر ابن هشام أو الله strengthen Islam with Omar ibn al-Khattab or Amr ibn Hisham and Amr ibn Hisham was Abu Jahl one of the leaders of the pagan opposition in the city of Mecca uh, and the, the prayer is uh, answered and uh, Abu Jahl is the one who is out of luck so we have a narrative on Ibn Abbasin radiallahu an Aslama ma'a Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tis'atun wa thalathun thumma anna Umara aslama fasaru arba'in 39 had converted along with Allah's messenger and then Umar converted and they became 40 fanazala Jibrilu alayhi salam bi qawli ta'ala hasbuka Allah wa man ittaba'aka min al-mu'minin and then Jibreel came down with the verse that says, Allah is enough for you and those who follow you amongst the believers. So when they were 40, this verse was revealed and the divine indication was that this would be enough, this would be a sufficiency. And actually one of the remarkable things about Hazrat Omar, and again, we'll talk about this later, inshallah, is his particular relationship with Allah's book and the way in which verses would be uh, revealed shortly after uh, Hazrat Omar had had a particular kind of inspiration. But um, before he converts, he is, as uh, we said, uh, an adversary of, of the Holy Prophet. And he sees the hijrah to Abyssinia and it angers him. Um, and the failure of Quraysh's attempt to extradite the asylum seekers in Ethiopia, um, they return empty-handed. And he sees, it seems that his opposition was not just that the Holy Prophet وسلم, was rejecting the, the gods and the idols of his people, but that he was dividing the city of Mecca. He saw himself as the great Meccan citizen who wished the city to be united. And he saw these two groups, the pagans uh, and the Muslims, uh, as a source of weakness for the city. So he saw this as a political as well as a spiritual issue. Anyway, the, the narrators uh, recount how one day he took his sword uh, with the intention of going out and physically attacking the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But he meets somebody in the street first and the famous story begins. ذَكَرَ أُسَامَ بِنْ زَيْدْ عَنْ أَبِيهِ عَنْ جَدِّهِ قَالْ قَالَ لَنَا عُمَرْ إِبْنِ الْخَطَّابِ أَتُحِبُّونَ أن أعلمكم كيف كان بدء إسلامي قلنا بلا So uh, Omar once said to us according to this uh, narrative uh, would you like to hear how my Islam began and we all said of course قال كنت من أشد الناس على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم He said I was one of the most hostile of people the fiercest of people against uh, God's messenger uh, and then he describes how he met somebody in the street. So he's going off to attack the Prophet. He has his sword, he's ready to do the deed. And he meets somebody, Nu'aym uh, bin uh, Abdullah, who looks at him and says, where are you going? And he says, um, I'm going to kill Muhammad. And Nu'aym says, but he tries to stall him because Nu'aym is a Muslim, but you'll be killed. Don't you know what the consequence will be? He's from the Quraysh tribe and there'll be um, consequences. That doesn't deter him. He tries to push past him. He's going to um, proceed with the assassination. So then, in order to hold his attention, because he knows that Omar is a family man, he says, why don't you go to back to your own family and set them to rights? And Omar says, who? Uh, who is now in Islam of my family? And he said, your own brother-in-law, Sa'ad, and your sister Fatima. So he turns around at this horrifying news and he goes to see um, his sister. And uh, Khabbab, who's one of the mustadafin, one of the poor um, 
uh, Meccan Muslims, is there with them in this small sort of covert group of new believers to recite um, some pages from the, the Quran that he has with him. And so Omar basically pushes in and starts shouting at his sister, Ya Aduat Nafsiha, enemy of her own self. Balagani and Naki Qad Sabat. I've heard that you've changed your religion. And of course, everybody knows Omar's reputation, and she hides the pages under her dress, and Khabab is hiding in the corner of the room. And Omar picks a fight with um, his brother in law and starts um, throwing punches. Fatima tries to intervene, and he hits her as well. Fasela dem, and um, her face starts to bleed. And when the woman saw the blood, she started crying. And then she said, Yabn al Khattab, Ma kunta fa'ilan fa'al faqat aslamt. Oh, Ibn al Khattab, do whatever you're going to do. It's true, I've become a Muslim. Aslamt, I'm Muslim. And then Omar takes up the story, Fadakhaltu wa ana mughdab. I went in and I was furious, enraged. Fajalestu ala sarir. And I sat down on the bed. But at this point, it seems that he's seen his sister's blood and he's starting to calm down. This is something that's um, uh, causing him a certain amount of guilt. So he sits on the bed. So I looked around and there were some pieces of paper, what well, would have been parchment then, in the corner of the house. And I said, What's this writing? Give it to me. فقالت, and then his sister said, لا أعطيك لست من أهلي. I won't give it to you because you don't deserve it. أنت لا تغتسل من الجنابة وهذا لا يمسه إلا المطهرون. Uh, you don't deserve this because you don't make غسل from your جنابة. And this is something which only the purified may touch. She's afraid, she's been hurt, she knows the anger that her brother is capable of, but still such is her love for Allah's book that she won't put it in his hands. He hasn't made his wudu. So what happens? He wants, he's curious, he wants to know what is going on. He's calmed down a little bit, his sister's been hurt. So he takes off his sword belt, puts it down, and swears by his gods not to harm the text. He just wants to look at it. And he washes himself. She, of course, wants him to know. She wants him to experience the beauty of Islam. And so she gives the, the pages to him. And what does he read? He reads the first ayahs of Surah Taha, which we all know. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Taha, ma anzalna alayka al-Qur'ana li tashqa. إلا تذكرة لمن يخشى تنزيلا ممن خلق الأرض والسماوات العلا الرحمن على العرش استوى له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض وما بينهما وما تحت الثرى صدق الله العظيم so he doesn't know what he's expecting, and he reads something that he was not expecting. It's the voice of heaven, the sound of eternity, that goes as the word of God can do, right into his heart. He's not a sinful person, he's not an arrogant person, he's just somebody whose sincerity has been for the wrong cause. And with such people, the, vo the voice of God can go in and can transform them like a bolt of lightning. Such people, as it were, lightning conductors. And if the lightning is there, it'll hit them first. These beautiful verses from Surah Taha. We have not sent down the Qur'an that you might be distressed. It is only a reminder for him who fears Allah. A revelation from the one who created the uh, earth and the seven heavens. The all-merciful who is established upon the throne. All of these beautiful verses, and suddenly this amazing passage with its beautiful lilting syncopations and the rhyming, it goes through to him. The circuit is completed, and there he is. So he puts it down, and he says, 
Ashadu Allah ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. Exactly the words which he hated to hear others saying, he's now been broken, transformed, a new man. Uh, and this is, it's significant that he comes to Islam through the Qur'an because, as I said, he does have a particularly strong relationship to it in later years. And actually, because he was known to be a man whose anger was fearful, uh, the Sahaba eventually realized that the way of calming him down when he was in a state of righteous anger was to recite the Qur'an to him. Um, Bilal used to say this in, in particular, that... Uh, when he got angry, it was something really tremendous. And when he was angry, when Omar was angry, we used to write, recite Quran to him until he calmed down. His anger would be settled and he'd stop what um, he had intended to do. So what does he do now? Having made the decision of his life, he says, where is Muhammad so that I may declare my shahada? Um, to him in person. And they say he's with some Muslims in the house of Al-Arqam. And so he goes there. And he takes up the story. So I went out until I banged on the door. And the voice came, who's that? Umar ibn al-Khattab. It's Umar ibn al-Khattab. al-Bab. And nobody inside had the courage to open the door. فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَمْ إِفْتَحْ فَإِنَّهُ إِنْ يُرِدِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا يَهْدِهِ And the Holy Prophet said to them, open the door. If Allah wishes something good for him, he will guide him. So, فَفُتِحَ لِي They opened the door for me. وَأَخَذَ رَجُلَانِ بِعَضُضَيَّ حَتَّى دَنَوْتُ مِنَ النَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَمْ And two men took me by the sides, as it were, holding me, in case I was going to attack, and brought me to the Prophet. فَقَالْ أَرْسِلُوا And he said, let him go. فَأَرْسَلُونِي فَجَلَسْتُ بَيْنِ يَدَيْ So they let me go, and I sat down right in front of him. فَأَخَذَ بِمَجْمَعَ قَمِيصِي وَجَذَبَنِي إِلَيْهِ ثُمَّ قَالْ And he reached out and he grabbed me by the shirt and pulled me to him. فَقَالْ أَسْلِمْ يَبْنَ الْخَطَّابِ Enter Islam, O Ibn al-Khattab. Allah Mahdihi, O Allah, guide him. Qultu ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa annaka rasulullah. And I said, I bear witness that there is no God but Allah and that you are his messenger. Fakabbar al-Muslimuna takbiratan sumi'at bi turuqi Makkah. And all the Muslims present said, Allahu Akbar, with such a loud takbir that it could be heard in, in the streets of Makkah outside the house. So he's taken this bold step and he's gone to the Prophet وسلم, to announce his bold step. And because of his boldness, what does he want to do now? He wants to tell all of the Prophet's enemies. That's the kind of impetuous, strong, decisive individual he is. So he goes out of the house of Al-Arqam, Ibn Abi Al-Arqam, to find the greatest opponent of the Prophet. <coughs> and he goes to the house of Abu Jahl, bangs on the door. And Abu Jahl says, welcome, best of welcomes to you, my sister's son. What brings you here? And Omar said, I have come to tell you that there is no God but Allah and that Muhammad is his messenger and that I believe in what he has been brought. May God curse you, says Abu Jahl, and slams the door in his face. And may God curse the news that you bring. So Omar's conversion is really important because he's this hero and completely fearless. Um, he's not going to be hiding anything. So uh, uh, Suhaib radiallahu an relates, "Lama aslama Omar, zahar al Islamu, wa daa ilayhi alaniyatan, wa jalasna hawl al baiti halaqan, wa tufna bil bait." When Omar converted, we, he called to Islam openly, and we would go to the Kaaba and pray at the Kaaba and do tawaf of of the house. And uh, despite the opposition, Omar used to go with Hamza and a group of the believers to the Kaaba and pray openly, and Quraysh were just afraid to intervene. Um, and this annoyed Quraysh so much that this was actually the trigger for the boycott, the, the muqata'a that was placed upon Bani Hashim, the, the Prophet's uh, tribe. 
so that nobody could marry into that tribe, nobody could do business with that tribe. Um, uh, the idea being to pressure them into expelling him or killing him or for him to uh, change his mind, to renounce prophethood. And because of the t this decisiveness, uh, Sayyidina Umar radiallahu an, re acquires his name of Al Farooq. Abu Bakr is called a Siddiq, the true believer. Hazrat Umar is called Al Farooq. So, Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Inna Allah ja'ala al haqqa ala lisani Umar wa qalbi. The Holy Prophet says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah has placed the truth upon the heart and the tongue of Umar. فَهُوَ الْفَارُوقِ فَرَّقَ اللَّهُ بِهِ بَيْنَ الْحَقِّ وَالْبَاطِلِ So he is the Faruq, which means the great distinguisher, the discerner. By him, Allah distinguishes truth from falsehood. So it, this title, just as the Siddiq is the Prophet's title for Abu Bakr, Faruq is the Prophet's title for, for Hazrat Umar. Um, and then, of course, the episode of the Hijrah, and we looked at the Hijrah uh, last time, and Abu Bakr has the great privilege of becoming Sani Isnain, the second in the two. Omar also has a, a remarkable story on the, the Hijrah. Uh, because, and this is one of the stories about Omar that comes from Hazrat Ali. قال علي ابن أبي طالب ما علمت أن أحدا من المهاجرين هاجر إلا مختفيا إلا عمر بن الخطاب. I don't know that any of the Muhajireen, the migrants from Mecca to Medina, um, didn't do it secretly except for Omar. Because when he had decided to make his hijrah, he put on his sword and he shouldered his bow and he took a handful of arrows and he went in front of the Kaaba and a group of the leaders of Quraysh were in the courtyard at the Kaaba. So then he said a strong, slow prayer. And then he did the tawaf seven times around the Kaaba. فَصَلَّى مُتَمَكِّنًا ثُمَّ قَالَ لَهُمْ Then he went to the maqam of Ibrahim and prayed solidly, confidently. ثُمَّ قَالَ لَهُمْ And then he said to them, شَاهِتِ الْوُجُوهِ The faces, uh, may the faces perish, may they be ugly. It's a way of holding people's attention. مَنْ أَرَادَ أَنْ تَثْكُلَهُ أُمُّ وَيُؤْتِمَ وَلَدَ وَيُرْمِلَ زَوْجَتَ Whoever wants his mother to be bereaved and his wife to be a, a widow, and his children to be orphans, let him just come and meet me in this valley. And Ali said, nobody wanted to accept the challenge, nobody went off to fight with him, but a, a group of the Mustadafin. Ali Mahum wa Arshadahum, a group of the weak Muslims who he knew, um, went with him uh, on the Hijrah. So that was uh, very characteristic of his personality. He certainly wasn't going to go off uh, furtively. Uh, as a hero, of course, he participates, as one would expect, in uh, many of the great Maghazi, the great uh, campaigns and battles. And even though we think of battles nowadays as the Battle of the Bulge or the Battle of Midway, enormous conflicts. In fact, the, the Prophet's campaigns in Arabia involved uh, a few hundred people, many of them only a few people. They were skirmishes. The totality of casualties uh, in the wars uh, that united Arabia was probably um, between 1,000 1,500. So we think of battles, but these are uh, relatively small events. But no less fearsome for that, and Sayyidina Omar is, is at the thick of them. So he's in Badr and Uhud and Khandaq and Khaybar and the conquest of Mecca and Hunayn uh, and he's at the Bay'at al-Ridwan the great pledging uh, uh, the tree of, uh, of Ridwan وَهُوَ مَعَ مَنْ ثَبَتَ مَعَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمَ فِي غَزْوَةِ أُحُد and he is one of those who didn't run away at Uhud and was strong with the Holy Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and, and stayed to defend him and because of his strength and his strong voice and his imposing uh, presence, the Holy Prophet ﷺ would often use him to rally people or to summon people. 
So at the Bay'at al-Ridwan, uh, the Holy Prophet والسلام, asks him to summon people to the Bay'at. Uh, there's a famous episode where at the Sulh of Hudaybiyah, which is the peace of Hudaybiyah, which as you'll recall from last time, was when the Muslims don't enter Mecca for the pilgrimage, but return, having made uh, a treaty, um, even though they're in the Ihram. Um, Quraysh ascending uh, Sahel bin Amr as their negotiator, matters are nearly resolved, and it just needs the agreement, the, the, the treaty document, to be written out. And Omar finds this hard to accept. He doesn't want any kind of truce with these people. He wants the pilgrimage to take place. They're in Ihram, so he jumps up. فَأَتَى أَبَا بَكْرٍ وَقَالْ And he went to Abu Bakr and said, Ya Abu Bakr, أَلَيْسَ بِرَسُولِ Oh, Abu Bakr, isn't he Allah's messenger? قَالَ بَلَا He said, yes. قَالْ أَوَلَسْنَا بِالْمُسْلِمِينَ And he said, are we not Muslims? قَالَ بَلَا He said, yes. قَالَ فَعَلَى مَا نُؤْتَ الدَّنِيَةَ فِي دِينِنَا And he said, why should we accept some kind of uh, humiliation in our religion? And then he went to the Prophet وسلم, and said the same things. And the Holy Prophet وسلم, just said, أَنَا عَبْدُ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولُهُ I'm Allah's slave and his messenger. لَنْ أُخَالِفَ أَمْرَهُ وَلَنْ يُضَيَّعَنِي I shall not go against his command and he will not um, cause me to be lost. فَكَانَ عُمَرُ يَقُولُ مَا زِلْتُ أَتَصَدَّقُ وَأَصُومُ وَأُصَلِّ وَأَعْتِقْ مِنَ الَّذِي صَنَعْتُ يَوْمَ إِذٍ مَخَافَتَكْ كَلَامِي الَّذِي تَكَلَمْتُ بِهِ From that time on, I was constantly praying and fasting and freeing slaves and giving sadaqa because of my fear of the words that I had said, which apparently went against the, 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 the will of the Holy Prophet he also leads some of the maghazi, some of the expositions. He, expeditions. He leads the uh, uh, expedition to the, the Hawazin. Uh, and that's so successful that when the Hawazin tribes hear of his approach, they actually just run away because he's such a, a formidable person. His reputation has preceded him. He has the st standard, the banner of the Holy Prophet at the Ghazwa of Khaybar, and so on. Uh, also appointed as a spokesman, this is very characteristically Omar, uh, at Uhud, you recall the Quraysh have basically won this skirmish, and Abu Sufyan and his people contentedly are getting ready to depart. Uh, and the Holy Prophet وسلم, tells Hazrat Omar um, to go up and reply to Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan has said, You had your day, and this is our day. And then he calls Abu Sufyan and says, Ya Hubal Azhir Dinak, O Hubal, make your religion victorious. So Omar is told to go and within earshot of the camp of the Quraysh. Um, he says to Omar, get up and reply to him. Allahu A'la wa ajal la siwa. So he's calling out in this huge voice across the, the desert night. It's quiet. He can be clearly heard by him. Everybody on the Meccan side, Allah is higher and more majestic. There is no God but Him. Qatlana fil jannati wa qatlakum fil nar. Our dead are in paradise and your dead are in hellfire. Qala Abu Sufyan. So Abu Sufyan calls out, Halumma ilayya ya Umar. He knows his voice. He says, Come to me, Umar. And the Holy Prophet says, Go, find out what he wants. فَجَاءَهُ فَقَالَ لَهُ So he came to him and said to him, uh, Abu Sufyan said to him, أُنْشِدُكَ بِاللَّهِ يَا عُمَر By God, uh, Umar. أَقَتَلْنَا مُحَمَّدًا Have we killed Muhammad? Because they've heard from this Ibn Qami'ah that the Prophet had been killed. So he wants to know, tell me, is it true that we've killed him? قَالَ لَا He said, no. وَإِنَّهُ لَيَسْمَعُ كَلَامَنَا And he can even hear uh, our words. His listening is within earshot. فَقَالَ أَبُو سُفْيَانَ أَنْتَ أَسْتَقُوا عِنْدِي مِنْ إِبْنْ قَمِعَ Abu Sufyan said, I think you're more likely to be right than Ibn Qami'a. So even in that uh, situation, he is the one who is, as it were, the Prophet's diplomat, the Prophet's uh, spokesman. After Uhud, uh, another example of the closeness of the two men comes about with Hafsa's marriage to the Holy Prophet ﷺ. She's a widow. Uh, very tragically, at the age of only 20, uh, she has been uh, widowed. Khunais uh, bin Abdullah, her husband, had, had died suddenly. Uh, 
Omar suggested her to Abu Bakr, who declined. Um, Omar became angry at this and offered her to uh, Othman. When Ruqayya, the Prophet's daughter Ruqayya, had died, um, he didn't have a wife, but Othman declined, saying, um, لا أرى أن أتزوج اليوم. He said, I don't wish to marry at the moment. فانطلق عمر إلى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. So Hazrat Omar goes to the Holy Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. فشكا إليه عثمان and kind of complains of Uthman. He's not marrying my daughter. And the Holy Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم delights him by offering marriage to the widow himself. And Hafsa turns out to be uh, a remarkable individual. And again, this particular relationship that uh, Hazrat Omar has with the Quran is plain. Because Hafsa has, uh, of all of the uh, wives of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a special relationship with the Qur'an. She's memorized the entire text. She's Hafiza. And for that reason, because of her strong knowledge of the text and her strong memory, uh, Abu Bakr, when he orders that the various pieces of the Qur'an be gathered together, it's not a complete mushaf at that time, but it's a kind of collection, orders that that be left in the house of Hafsa for her safekeeping. Um, Hafsa is also significant in that uh, in later years she was sometimes used as a mediator with Omar. If people were afraid to approach him directly with some thing they wanted to put to him, they would go to him through his daughter. Um, on several occasions when he was Khalifa, the Muslims were so mortified to see that taxes and booty and all kinds of stuff is coming into Medina from the far horizons. And Omar is still wearing his woolen shirt that's patched with kind of leather patches. And he's not happy that he's got a winter shirt as well as a summer shirt. Most of the time he's walking barefoot. Uh, we are now the masters of the Byzantine Empire and the Persian Empire. And our ruler is hungry. So on several occasions they tried to get Hafsa to sort of speak to her father. To get him to um, up his living standards. Liyat'ama ta'aman alyan wa uh, so that he would eat sort of more delicate foods and wear something more comfortable. And they said to him, say that the Muslims are happy for him to take something from this, uh, the spoils of war. And all of the Muslims are very happy for him to do this. But he refused. And he kept to the sunnah, as he understood it, as a real ascetical figure, partly to be an example to his governors, because he wanted the governors of these new provinces not to copy the palatial ways of the Byzantine and the Persian governors, but to be simple desert people who would live as did the poorest of their populations. Um, in any case, uh, Last time we covered the death of the Holy Prophet والسلام, when he saw the key role that Omar plays, his courage at the Saqif of the Bani Sa'idah, when it looks as if tribalism is going to prevail again and that the Ansar, or some of them, will go their way and the Aus and Khazraj will split and then there will be an Amir in Mecca and it's the end of this impossible dream that's actually been realized of the unity of, of Arabia. And Omar is the one who pledges his bay'ah, first of all, to Abu Bakr Put out your hand, O Abu Bakr, and I will pledge your allegiance. And then Abu Ubaidah does that. And then slowly the Aus and the Khazraj follow. And the catastrophe um, is averted. And uh, that was essentially Omar's heroism and, and Omar's um, initiative. Abu Bakr dies after two years of, of rule. And it's been, as we saw, uh, a difficult time with the rebellion, the apostasy of the tribes of, of Najd in particular. But the succession is very easy, because before he dies, Abu Bakr simply nominates Omar to be his successor. Uh, he feels that he's going to die. He asks Othman to write down his last uh, testament. And in that specifically, he designates uh, Omar to be the uh, second ruler. And he says, if Allah asks me whom I appointed, I will say that I appointed um, the best man amongst you. Why did he choose Omar? Partly because of Omar's particular uh, closeness to the uh, Holy Prophet. Uh, partly because he saw that real strength was required. 
the borders were being breached, the Byzantines were a threat, the Persians were a threat, they were starting to get together for the first time ever to wipe out the new religion in Arabia. Desert tribes had been rebelling. Everything was very new. The world had been changed, but it could easily snap back into its old millennial ways again. And he knew that somebody really tough, a, a real sort of hero man, should be uh, in charge. So this seems to be why he chose him that he saw that somebody uh, rigorous was required because of Omar's anger. But the anger was never for himself, it was for Allah. He was a man of Jalal, a man of uh, majesty. You can say, and we'll be looking at this a little bit later, that the different kinds of perfection that the four Jahar Yar, four friends represent, is Abu Bakr is the Jamal, and Omar is the Jalal, and Othman is the kind of beautiful adab, aristocratic principle, and Hazrat Ali is the principle of Futuwa, um, sacred warriorhood. Each different uh, aspects of the the integrated perfection of the Holy Prophet, Ali Wasallam. So he accepts and he makes his acceptance speech. One of the things about Omar is that he speaks very beautifully and one of the reasons for his political success is that. Amma ba'al faqad ibtulitum bikum wa ibtulitum bi. He says, uh, I am being tested through you and you are being tested through me. It's almost like speaking to the population, you're my misfortune and I'm your misfortune. <laughs> it's not a very uh, proud thing to say. Um, and I have been appointed um, to be the deputy, Ba'da Sahibaya, after my two friends, after the Holy Prophet and, and Hazrat Abu Bakr. And then he makes a du'a, much of his acceptance speech is a du'a. Allahumma inni shadidun falayinni. O Allah, I am tough, so make me gentle. Wa inni da'ifun faqawini. And I am weak, so strengthen me. Wa inni bakhilun fasakhini. And I am mean and avaricious, so make me generous. Uh, and indeed, he turns out to be a... Uh, Majestic, uh, majestic ruler, uh, but somebody of the four caliphs who is most feared, I think. Ashaddu nasi fi dinillahi Omar, the Holy Prophet says, the one who is toughest in Allah's religion is Omar. And his uh, symbol of office almost is this stick that he, wear, he, he carries as he goes around Medina in order to correct people if he sees any injustice or people... Um, misbehaving. He's a kind of police force um, on his own, even though he introduces one of the one of history's first police forces in his new empire. He kind of starts it himself. To give you a, a famous example, رُوِيَ أَنَّ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ خَرَجَ فِي بَعْضِ مَغَازِي فَلَمَّا انصَرَفَ جَاءَتْ جَارِيَةٌ سَوْدَاء فَقَالَتْ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ it's narrated that the Holy Prophet وسلم, went off on one of his expeditions. And when he came back, um, uh, a young black servant girl came and said, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, inni, nadar, inni kuntu nadartu in raddakallahu saliman an adri babayna yadayka biddaf. I made a vow to Allah that if he brings you back safe, I will celebrate by banging my drum in front of you and presumably reciting poetry as well. Now this is something that's potentially uh, inappropriate for a girl to be kind of uh, performing in, in this way. But he says, قَالْ إِنْ كُنْتِ قَدْ نَذَرْتِ فَضْرَبِي وَإِلَّا فَلَا And he says, if you've made a vow, then bang your drum. If not, then you don't need to. فَجَعَلَ tadrib, And then she started banging her little drum. And some of the companions entered, one of them was Abu Bakr, and she kept on banging the drum. ثُمَّ دَخَلَ Omar, radiallahu an, and then Omar came in. فَأَلْقَتِ الدَّفَ تَحْتَ إِسْتِهَا وَقَعَدَتْ عَلَيْهِ And when she saw Omar, she tucked the drum underneath her and kind of sat on it. She didn't want him to see. Um, and the Holy Prophet tells Hazrat Omar what, what's happened and said, uh, Omar, there is nobody who is not afraid of you. Uh, and there's many stories of this. This is Amr bin Ma'ruf wa Nahi anil Munkar. 
commanding uh, what is right and forbidding what is wrong. And Omar is particularly shadid or strong in this. Uh, he's the first to be called Amir al-Mu'minin. The title uh, begins with him. Some of the Sahaba were saying, what shall we call our new ruler? He's not a king, he's not a tribal chief. Sayyidina Abu Bakr was Khalifa Rasulillah, the successor of Allah's messenger. It's awkward to say Khalifa to Khalifa to Rasulillah, the successor of the successor of Allah's messenger. That's not a very splendid title. So they hit on the title of Amir al-Mu'mineen, the commander of the believers. Another thing uh, that comes up again and again uh, during the Holy Prophet's lifetime uh, is that if we look at the spirituality of Sayyidina Omar, it has something to do with the Jalal of the Qur'anic text itself. Allah says, we shall send down upon you a heavy word. Um, and uh, the, the power of the, the Qur'an comes down on the Holy Prophet And his forehead was pouring forth sweat on a very cold day. And this strength is something that resonates with, with Omar. And so we have in the books of Tafsir again and again, and for some of the ulama, there's 20 specific cases, episodes in Omar's life where he seems to anticipate the revelation of a Quranic verse. So Ibn Omar, his son, used to say, when people said one thing and Omar said another, the Quran would be revealed to confirm what Omar said. So, famous hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, um, that... Uh, <coughs> Sayyidina Umar said, Ya Rasulullah, if only we were to take the place of Ibrahim as a praying place. And then Allah's word was revealed, and take the place of Ibrahim as your praying place. This is the Maqam Ibrahim in the Haram in Mecca. And then, Ya Rasulullah, he says, good, good people come to your house to visit you. And bad people come to your house to visit you. So if you put a hijab, a curtain, that would be better for the modesty of your wives. And that is why the ayah, the verse of the hijab, was revealed. And again and again we find this uh, extraordinary anticipation. number of miracles uh, attributed to him. He had the particular ability to recognize lies. Uh, this is part of the strength of his personality. He was a master of, of of, of men, he could read people very easily. Uh, Al Hassan said, if anybody could recognize uh, a liar, it was Omar ibn al Khattab. And one story, which is very famous, which is authenticated by Ibn Hajr al Asqalani in his uh, Kitab al Isaba, is the famous story where um, Omar is in Medina giving his khutbah, and suddenly in the middle of the khutbah he cries out, Ya Sariyat al Jabal, Ya Sariyat al Jabal, Ya Sariyat al Jabal. O Sariya, the mountain. And people have no idea what this is about. Later, an army comes back from Syria, and they said that in the neighborhood of Nihavend, they'd been almost defeated, and then they heard this voice apparently coming from nowhere, telling their chief, who was called Sariya, the army commandment, to go to the mountain, have their backs to the mountain, and then uh, Allah defeated their enemies. Um, so we find this individual who is the ruler of this enormous expanding empire uh, but at the same time somebody who is uh, a champion of another kind of empire which is the empire of the soul or the spirit he is a great Zahid he is one of the great exemplars amongst the Sahaba of Taqashuf really not being interested at all in the treats of this world. Fine food, fine clothes, where you sleep, a big house, status, prestige, all of that stuff that people are distracted by. Um, it doesn't mean anything to him. Uh, so, And he imposes this on his subordinates. Whenever he appointed a governor to a province, <coughs> he would apply certain rules. He's not allowed to ride a fine horse in public. He's not allowed to eat luxurious food. He's not allowed to dress in splendid robes. He's never allowed to shut his door against the poor. And if the new governor doesn't comply with these rules, the judge, the qadi of the town, is uh, instructed to punish him. So being a governor for Omar was not kind of the opportunity to 
fleece the population as it very often was or still is in many parts of the world. It was kind of um, nerve-wracking. Uh, he turns out to be a hero also in a year when there is drought, a dreadful drought. In, it's in uh, the, uh, uh, the, the fourth year of his Khilafah. And it's a drought throughout Arabia and there's no rain and animals are dying, thousands of people are dying and refugees are coming into Medina. There's just no rain, people have nothing, their lives are already, even in good years, marginal and now um, they're starving to death. In that whole year, Omar never ate butter or fat. His stomach used to groan and he used to slap his stomach when it made a noise in public because he was hungry, he would slap it, saying, nothing more for us until the people have something to eat. Um, he once came in upon his son Asim and he found his son Asim eating meat. What's that? he says. And he replied, it's something that we desired. And Omar said, do you eat something just because you desire it? It's enough wastefulness for a man that he eats whatever he desires. Another episode, Omar himself narrated, one day my heart craved a fresh fish. So Yarfa, his helper, mounted his camel and rode off four miles uh, to a market and brought back a basket full of fish. There were kind of ponds in Medina where people would produce fresh fish. Uh, and then Yarfa went in to Omar and Omar said, let's get up, I want to look at the camel. And he said, have you tormented an animal just for the sake of Omar's appetite? He'd ridden the camel for four miles in the sun just so I can have a fish. La wallahi, he says, no by God. Omar will not taste anything from your basket. Other things about uh, Omar. On his Omrah, he didn't bring a tent, uh, but instead simply took his top garment, the rida, and flung it over a bush and went to sleep under that. Walking around in Medina, if he ever saw something that might be useful to anybody, even a rag or a piece of wood, he would pick it up and throw it into somebody's house just in case it turned out to be useful. Um, one of his relatives once came to him and said, you have the Beit al-Mal, he institutes the, the treasury in the Muslim uh, polity. And his relative said, can I have something from the, the treasury? And Omar shouts at him, he berates him. Do you want me to meet Allah as one of the kings who abuse their trust? And then he goes to his own property and gives him 10,000 silver coins from his own property. During his Khilafah, he shows another dimension to his personality, which is actually he's a kind of lateral thinker. He does a lot of new things. Already, Arabia has been made new. Tribalism has been replaced by the Sharia. Paganism has been replaced by Tawheed. Um, the tribes are now united under a single government. This has never happened before in a million years of Arabian history. But Omar is somebody who is uh, also thinking big and thinking, uh, laying down some of the policies which become part of Muslim political theory uh, after that. So, for instance, one of his innovations is that he's the first to use the Hijri dating and this comes from the, the, uh, the 16th year of the Hijra. And uh, he's the one who introduces it. In Rabi al-Awwal of the year 16, the Muslims start to use um, the calendar, which uh, we still use today. He's the first person to have collected all of the Qur'an in a single book. He is the first person to have created garrison towns. Following the conquests, instead of the Muslims living in the ancient cities and having to find places to live uh, and clashing with the local populations and interfering with their ways and being influenced by them, he creates new cities. He's the founder of cities, including great cities like Basra and Kufa in southern Iraq uh, and their cities further east in Iran and also Fustat in Egypt, which we'll talk about shortly. He's the founder of those cities. Fustat then grows into Cairo, so you could say he founded the city of Cairo. Uh, the historians say he's the first person to have created the system of pensions. Now, as he said in his acceptance speech, um, I am with the weak amongst you. 
And uh, he's creating something that almost looks like a welfare state. Because from the revenues of the treasury, and now they're ruling this huge area, uh, he is giving money to orphans and for the support of the old. One of the first cases in history where there is state funding in a systematic way, a pension for old people, and also for pensioners who have been uh, returning from the wars. Um, in the year of the drought, he also creates some kind of uh, famine relief. Uh, thousands are dying, especially in the desert. Medina, the mosque, is packed with refugees. And he introduces a rationing system, and he also uh, has public dinners. And we're told that maybe 100,000 people in Medina would attend these dinners, and they were free. Um, but the food was limited, uh, so he sent out letters to his new governors in, in Syria, Iran, and Egypt. Um, and Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah, who's in Syria, sends him a letter saying, of course, ya Amir al muminah I shall send you a camel loaded with food so long that when the first camels of the caravan get to Medina, um, the end of the caravan is still uh, making its way out of Damascus. So the famine is relieved through Omar's uh, speedy um, famine relief efforts, and the other caravans that are coming in are diverted to other parts of Arabia, including Najd. And the people of Najd, who have rebelled against Abu Bakr, uh, have a lot to thank Omar for, because firstly, all of the captives of those wars, Omar releases. One of the first things he does after taking power is he releases all of the war prisoners. Uh, and also, they're receiving caravans from, uh, from Syria, uh, which save probably hundreds of thousands of them from, from starvation. And that does a lot to kind of cement uh, caliphal authority there and to make them realize that being part of the world of Islam is, is a good thing. And the next year, alhamdulillah, the rain uh, returns and Omar sends back the refugees, the displaced people, to their own homelands and exempts them from the payment of zakat for two years just to make things easier. Uh, he leads the people in the Hajj every year, every year of his uh, Khilafah, he's on the Hajj. Uh, and in the final year uh, of his rule, he also um, uh, takes the Prophet's widows on the Hajj, all of them. Um, he makes a point of taking them with him on, on the Hajj. Uh, because of the growing size of Islam, uh, he takes the initiative to expand the Haramain. In Mecca, basically there was the Kaaba and a kind of open space around it, and then streets just coming out into the open space. He buys some of the neighboring houses, demolishes them, and puts a wall around. And some of the doors into the Kaaba that are there to this day, obviously they've been updated and they're much fancier now, but the locations are reflecting the ways in which uh, uh, Hazrat Omar would place uh, doors there and Abu Bakr had not done this uh, and in Medina as well the wooden pillars were replaced with brick pillars the, the haram was extended in the direction of the qibla of course the, um, the hujurat the, the rooms of the wives of the holy prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam were inviolable um, he wouldn't demolish those and he also creates a place quite characteristic a place called al Butayha, which is just to the east of the mosque He's annoyed when people are kind of engaging in chit-chat in the mosque or arguing in the mosque. So he designates a particular place. If people want to gossip or chat or raise their voices or argue, they go to that place called Butayha uh, and leave the mosque for, um, for prayer and for ibadah. Uh, in terms of his commitment to this welfare state idea, his style as a ruler is quite... Uh, remarkable and there's many stories that are told of his uh, sense of personal accountability for the poorest in, in the city of Medina. His habit was to go out at night and to see if uh, what was going on. Um, and one night he went past a house with a courtyard and he heard children crying and there was a woman who was cooking. So he calls out, Ya amat Allah, ma balu yabkun. O oh, female slave of Allah, why are those children crying? Qalat bukauhum min And she says, they're crying from hunger. And he says, but you're cooking. And he says, it's just water that I'm boiling to lull them into thinking that food is coming so that they go to sleep. Fabaka Omar. And Omar cries. 
And he goes to the treasury and he takes a sack and he fills the sack with grain and with dates uh, and with clothes. And uh, he tells his uh, servant and assistant, Aslam, Ya Aslam, ihmal alayya. Aslam, help me to carry this, put it on my back. فقال يا أمير المؤمنين أن أحمله أنك أفضل O commander of the believers I can carry it for you it's better for me to carry it Omar is about 60 at this time فقال أم لك يا أسلم he says O Aslam you wretch أنا أحمله لأني المسؤول عنهم في الآخرة I'm going to carry it because I'm the one who will be asked about them in the next world فحمله على عاتقه so he carried it on his shoulder حتى أتى به إلى دار المرأة until he brought it to the woman's house and then he tipped some oil and other things into the pot and he cooked it himself and he cooked it and then when it was done he put the food himself into the mouths of the children and then, and Aslam recorded this afterwards he amused the children by pretending to be a lion and kind of making them laugh and Aslam said, why did you do that? And he said, on my way there, I promised myself that I wouldn't leave until I saw the children smiling. And so I couldn't make them smiling, just with the, smile just with the food. And so I um, played around um, until they laughed. Important to remember that, because sometimes we think of Omar as being somebody who is tough with women. Um, and the story about the black girl who hides the drum because she's afraid of Omar can sometimes give us that sense. Kind of stern, patriarchal figure. But actually... His concern for women uh, is uh, reported in a number of, of uh, famous accounts. Um, so let's listen to this, and there's, there's a lot of these, and there's some of them quite extraordinary. An al-Shabi qal, al-Shabi narrated, Ata Umar ibn al-Khattab, a rajulun, a man came to Umar ibn al-Khattab, faqal, inna bnatan, كنت ودأتها في الجاهلية. I have a daughter who I buried alive in the Jahiliya. فاستخرجناها قبل أن تموت. But then we um, pulled her out again before she died. فأدركت معنى الإسلام فأسلمت. And then she lived into the time of Islam with us and she became Muslim. ثم أصابها حد من حدود الله. And then she committed one of the mortal sins, a criminal offense. Um, Probably the senses um, here, fornication or adultery. And she, after having committed the sin, she took a knife in order to kill herself. And she, uh, we were able to stop her, even though she'd already cut some of her veins. فَدَاوَيْنَاهَا حَتَّى بَرَأَتْ And then we bandaged her up and, and healed her until she was well. ثُمَّ أَقْبَلَتْ بَعْضُ تَوْبَةٍ حَسَنًا And then after that she made her tawbah and she um, became a righteous person. وَهِيَ تُخْطَبْ إِلَىٰ قَوْمٍ أَفَأُخْبِرُهُمْ بِالَّذِي كَانْ And now uh, she is being proposed to by um, somebody should I tell that somebody and his family about her story? In other words, if I should, is it my duty to tell them that she's troubled, she's had this difficult history? فَقَالَ عُمَرْ أَتَعْهَدُ إِلَى مَا سَتَرَهُ اللَّهُ فَتُبْدِي And Omar said, are you going to make public something which Allah has hidden? Wallahi. لَإِنْ أَخْبَرْتَ بِشَأْنِهَا أَحَدًا مِنَ النَّاسِ لَأَجْعَلَنَّكَ نَكَالًا لِأَهْلِ الْأَمْصَارِ By Allah, if you tell anybody about her story, I shall inflict a punishment upon you that will be feared even by the people of the, the garrison towns. And كِحَا نِكَاحَ الْعَفِيفَةِ الْمُسْلِمَةِ Give her a marriage, the marriage of a chaste Muslim woman. That's uh, characteristic. And there's uh, other tales that could be said about uh, Omar and his defense of, 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 of women and of their honor. Now, we haven't looked much at his specific policies and we focused on uh, Omar in Medina and the people of Medina and his sort of social welfare 
uh, initiatives. But at the same time, the world is being changed outside the frontiers. The conquest of Syria is already underway. Remember that Byzantines have been massing at the frontier. There has already been a, a conflict at, at, at Mu'tah. Abu Bakr has sent the army um, that is present outside Medina at the death of the Holy Prophet وسلم, and he sent them north to Syria. Um, and Abu Bakr has seems to have been a great strategist because there's a four-pronged uh, invasion of Syria. Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah is invading from the south. Uh, and Khalid ibn al-Walid, the great general who's now a Muslim, uh, has marched suddenly and in a very brilliant flanking movement across the desert from al Hira in southern Iraq to catch the Byzantines uh, unexpectedly from, from the east. And he does this by finding a, a route across the trackless desert so that for two days the army doesn't drink anything but they come to the oasis that they're heading for in time. And this um, allows them to uh, fight the Battle of Ajnadain in the time of, of Abu Bakr. It's one of the great battles of early Islam. Uh, and then uh, they move on to besiege Damascus. And it's during the siege of Damascus that Hazrat Abu Bakr dies. Uh, after the siege, Khalid allows the Byzantine soldiers to withdraw and gives them three days to withdraw and guarantees peace to the population. That's the first Muslim conquest of, of Damascus. One of the first things Omar does is to sack Khalid. Uh, we're not quite sure why. Khalid, one of the greatest generals of history, um, is defeating the Persians and the Byzantines simultaneously. Uh, Omar sacks him, uh, possibly because Khalid is new in Islam. He was uh, the champion of the Quraysh in their attempts to um, attack Medina before he was uh, a Muslim. And he seems to have feared, and he was a good judge of character, that maybe Khalid was starting to um, get political ideas of his own, but we don't really know. But in any case, Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah sees Khalid no longer the field marshal, but he makes him commander of the cavalry, which turns out to be a, a decision of of, of of enormous uh, repercussions. Uh, once they've taken Damascus, they move west. And now Palestine is more or less cut off. Uh, and slowly the cities of Palestine, Palestine are reduced. Uh, Gaza, Tiberias, um, Nablus, uh, Caesarea, which is on the coast, until only Jerusalem remains in, in Byzantine hands. The Byzantine emperor, Heraclius, shattered by this, uh, offers them a truce. Uh, and the truce is agreed to, but treacherously Heraclius launches an attack anyway. Uh, and this allows Khalid and Abu Ubaidah to start moving into northern Syria. Um, and they capture Hems, the town of Amesa, of course. Hems is the city which now is um, being besieged by the Alawite forces. Um, but it was Khalid who's actually buried in, in Hems who first captured it for the Muslims. And he captures some Byzantine prisoners and frees them. And one of them tells him that Heraclius is secretly raising a gigantic army of 200,000 men, which by the standards of the time, even by contemporary standards, that's bigger than the entire British army now, for instance. It's a huge force in order to take back Damascus and strike further south, uh, Medina, Mecca. So the, the conquest of northern Syria is called off and Khalid moves back to Damascus. And at the same time, uh, the, the Byzantine emperor has uh, entered into an alliance with the Persian emperor, Yazdegerd III, so that they will coordinate their attacks simultaneously to completely um, destroy Muslim forces. But Yazdegerd doesn't actually do this uh, for various reasons, and this uh, allows... <laughs> Uh, the Muslims to hold on to Syria. Omar is writing letters to Yazdegerd, inviting him to Islam, but he refuses. So this huge army of Heraclius uh, is, uh, moves south, and the intention is to mop up the Muslim armies in different places to divide their forces. And Khalid and Abu Ubaidah retreat to the plain of Yarmouk uh, uh, and withdraw from northern Syria. And incidentally, you get a, a great sense of Omar's and his governor's akhlaq in this, in that before they leave these towns that they've occupied, they repay all of the taxes that they have charged. They say, we're not going to be ruling you, so we don't have the right to this haraj and the, the jizya. So they go around household, household, paying them back the, the taxes that they have charged, which are one of the few cases in history of taxes being 
uh, systematically repaid, I guess. Uh, but anyway, they withdraw from northern Syria, and uh, the Battle of Yarmouk takes place. One of the three or four great monumental apocalyptic battles in human history. Byzantine legions, about 125,000 crack troops, including the kind of heavy armor of the day, the cataphracts, the heavy Byzantine cavalry, more or less unstoppable. Um, and it's good terrain for cavalry. It's the flat plain near the river Yarmouk, which flows east into the Jordan. 125,000 Byzantines, about 30,000 Muslims. And the Byzantines have these huge tank-like heavy cavalry, feudal cavalry from Anatolia. And they chain together their infantry um, in order to emphasize that they're not going to run away and to make it harder for the Muslim-like cavalry to, to cross their lines. And the battle lasts for six days. And it's a great thing in the Arab chronicles. And each day has a particular name. The first day is a day of kind of single combat. Each army sends out a hero. Uh, and they watch uh, him challenge the hero from the other side. And the Byzantines start to become disoriented because already some of the Byzantines are kind of weakening uh, and are converting to Islam. And one of the Byzantine commanders, uh, a certain George, comes out as though he's to challenge one of the Muslims, but instead says he's shahada and goes over to the Muslim side. So this conflict goes on day after day, and Khalid isn't really moving very much. For five days, it's basically a defensive struggle. But then on the uh, sixth day, suddenly he seizes his opportunity. He's already blocked off the possible points of exit where the Byzantines might run away to if, if they were broken and defeated. So there's no way for them to escape. And he sends in his uh, light cavalry. And the light cavalry is really the kind of uh, piece de resistance of the, the Muslim army. Um, these are people who've been brought up in the desert with, with, with horses all of their lives. And uh, they're so well coordinated that they manage to strike the Byzantines unexpectedly at various weak points and to divide the heavy cavalry. The heavy cavalry flees uh, uh, and the infantry is left vulnerable and the Byzantines are, uh, are shattered. So Khalid pursues the retreating Byzantines, and then he is able to recapture Damascus, where it seems that he's welcomed by the population. Uh, part of the population is Arab anyway. Many of them are Monophysites, are not happy with Byzantine Christianity, which has been persecuting them. The Jews systematically are in favor of the Muslim conquest, because the Byzantines have been persecuting them, and the Muslims are promising to allow them to live in Jerusalem again. So they're welcomed when they return to uh, Damascus in the second conquest. Heraclius, who's in Antioch, flies into a rage, goes back to Constantinople and bids Syria a final farewell. And the region has been Muslim to this day. Omar's famous entry into Jerusalem, uh, he comes north from Medina for this, and he knows that it's a symbolically important event. He has one camel, and his servant with him take it in turns to ride it. This is Omar's sense of justice. He's not going to have the servant leading the camel while he's sitting on it. They take it in turns. And when they come to the city gates of, of Jerusalem, uh, the servant is on the camel. It says, you're entering Jerusalem. The patriarch is waiting. Um, uh, shall I come down so that you can ride? And he says, no, it's, it's your turn. Uh, Islam is enough glory for us. So he enters Jerusalem in his old dirty clothes with the patches and the patriarch. Um, Sophronius offers the key to the Holy Sepulchre and the city is uh, Muslim, but the people are given their liberty, the Jews are allowed back, and the Christian minorities have been persecuted by the Byzantines, especially the uh, Monophysites and the Nestorians are really happy because they're um, now allowed to worship freely. Now, the story goes on, and it's worth being aware of this because this is uh, Omar's genius as, as Khalifa. Um, really a world conqueror, as well as somebody who is master of himself. Amr ibn al-As, one of the great Sahaba, has been at Yarmouk, and he takes 4,000 men in the direction of Egypt. Uh, and some of these men are actually Greek converts to Islam, and some of them are Persian converts to Islam. Islam is already starting to spread. Not too many of them are Arab levies. Omar hears of this and says, what do you mean you're going to conquer Egypt. 
And so he sends a fast messenger on a fast horse to stop him, or at least with a message in an envelope saying, um, if, you go, if, if this letter comes to you and you're not in Egypt, then return. But if you've already started and you're in Egypt, when you get this message, then may Allah help you, and if you need reinforcements, I'll send them. So the messenger comes out of breath, and Amr can see here's a message from Amir al muminin and he kind of knows what's going to be in the message. So he says, we'll open the Khalifa's message when the army is resting at the end of the day. We can't stop now. And by the time it's the end of the day, they're over the border, and he opens the message and he says, well, may Allah be with us. And they continue. Um, this, again, hugely momentous task of just 4,000 men invading one of the richest Byzantine provinces. They besieged the city of Pelusium at one of the mouths of the uh, Nile. After a two-month siege, they take the city of Pelusium, and then they start to move south. And all kinds of odd things are happening in Egypt. Rumors of the fact that Muslim rule is a good thing, particularly for Christian sectarian movements, has already filtered into Egypt. The great bulk of the population is not uh, followers of the official Diophysite view of Christianity, which the Byzantines had been imposing, but they're Monophysites, which is, um, just to sum it up, the great church in Constantinople and the Emperor Heraclius believed that Jesus' human and divine natures were separate. But for the Monophysites, that was impossible. Jesus could have only one center of consciousness. He had to be an integrated person. So the divine and the human were perfectly fused within him. And the Byzantines had been treating them pretty badly. So one reason why they're making such success, successful conquests is that they're kind of popular because these minorities know that they'll be better treated under the Muslims. So they conquer Pelusium and they move towards Babylon, which is the great fortress of Egypt, where the two branches of the Nile spread out, where the delta begins, upper and lower Egypt begin at that point. And it seems one of the reasons for their success is that the patriarch, patriarch stroke governor, of Egypt, a certain Cyrus, who's called al muqawqis um, and had had good relations with the Prophet wasallam. it seems that he actually wanted the Arabs to win. Uh, and some say that he was a secret Muslim, we'll never probably know, but in any case, he uh, makes things a lot easier for them. But there's this huge fortress which they have to deal with, and the walls are five foot thick, and they're, they're 60 feet high, and he's got these 4,000 men and there's 30,000 Byzantine troops in and around the fortress. So they reduce neighboring fortresses. They scale the walls of Heliopolis. The defenders flee. And they try the same thing at Babylon. He chooses men who are really good at climbing at night. They climb in. They manage to fight their way to the doors. They open the doors of the fortress. And the Muslims rush in. And the garrison, basically, they run away. Again, all kinds of treachery as possible. Uh, maybe it was Cyrus himself who had the doors open. We'll never know. But the garrison flee to an island in the Nile. Cyrus surrenders to Omar and writes a declaration of submission. Egypt is yours. But Heraclius refuses to accept this and thinks Cyrus is playing some uh, miserable game. But generally, the Copts in Egypt side with the Muslims. The Muslims besiege Alexandria. Um, Heraclius dies and isn't able to send uh, uh, an army to relieve it or a fleet from Constantinople, and uh, the city is captured. Omar, hearing this news, this kind of unintentional conquest, he's been starting to send reinforcement, but still, it's really a sideshow. One of his big decisions is that he decides that Alexandria will no longer be the capital because it's too exposed. It's on the coast, it's uh, open to Byzantine or other depredations. And so his decision is to move the capital to Fustat, uh, which is now a southern suburb of Cairo. For start, originally means a tent because it's said to have been where Amr ibn al-As pitched his tent um, and hence the place is called the suburb of the tent. Omar does all kinds of things in Egypt. For instance, he orders that a canal be dug connecting this area of Fustat so that you can navigate from the Nile to uh, the Red Sea. Very far-sighted um, and significant uh, thing to do. Uh, somebody even proposes an early version of the Suez Canal. They say, why don't we build a canal from the Mediterranean to uh, the Red Sea? But Omar decides against this, partly because it would seem to open a way of attack to the holy cities, so it's not built. 
So Syria is now Muslim or has accepted Muslim authority. Egypt has accepted Muslim authority. The third great conquest is Persia, in a sense an even more formidable achievement. Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu an, in the time of Abu Bakr has already captured some of the fortresses in Mesopotamia. And Omar orders that the conquest should continue. <laughs> and there is the momentous battle of, of Qadisiyah with uh, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, where the uh, feudal cavalry of the Persians are completely shattered. And although the conquest still takes uh, years, and it's only in the 640s that um, the Muslims start to move up into what's now the Caucasus and conquer most of the Caucasus and um, into Central Asia. Uh, and then a little bit later to the uh, Indus Valley, uh, the first sort of Muslim uh, probings into India actually take place in the time of, of, of Omar. Uh, and uh, Tbilisi in Armenia uh, is also added to his empire. So this is uh, an extraordinary process that, that, that's happening. Uh, and the last of the emperors, uh, Yazdegerd III, is a kind of um, uh, running away in Central Asia and eventually is killed by a, a peasant just for his purse. He meets an ignominious death, and that's the end of the Persian Empire. Why is it that that was so uh, quick and so complete? And already met military strategists are going to be furrowing their brows when they consider what Omar is doing. Egypt is being conquered, Syria is being conquered, they're moving up into the, the plateau of central Anatolia, and they're conquering Persia at the same time. It's extraordinary. They're dividing their forces, but doing it with brilliant success. Uh, again, just as many Christians and Jews certainly have been happy with the Muslim conquest in Syria, Palestine, Egypt, so also a lot of people in Iran seem to have been fed up with the shahs and the, the rulers and also the Zoroastrian priestly hierarchy. There were certain structural problems with Zoroastrianism and the people actually, uh, many of them, uh, seem to have uh, converted to Islam quickly. Um, the people who were most dissatisfied were the, were the castes in Zoroastrian society, uh, which were regarded as impure and weren't allowed into many of the, the fire temples and weren't allowed to practice some of the basic rituals because their professions involved the use of fire. Fire is a sacred element in Zoroastrianism. So if you, needed, if you were a cook, for instance, or if you needed fire in order to um, deal with leather or some other practice or to make um, bricks, you were considered to be impure. And those outcast individuals were often some of the first to convert to Islam. Also, it's believed that many Zoroastrians saw that the uh, religious system whereby uh, the, the monotheistic one god of uh, Zoroast, uh, Zoroaster, Ahura Mazda, was identified, it seems, with the Muslims who were coming to liberate them from the very stratified and hierarchical society of ancient Persia. And the uh, tyrants of Ctesiphon were identified with Ahriman, or the evil force. So it was seen as a kind of bolt of light that was coming in order to liberate them. Uh, there were other things about Zoroastrian practice, and actually if you look at uh, modern day uh, Zoroastrianism, you'll find that many of the liberalizing or modernizing tendencies amongst Zoroastrians kind of indicate certain weaknesses that facilitated uh, Omar's program in, in, in Persia. Uh, so, for instance, uh, the practice of uh, purification with bull's urine, uh, which is a basic Zoroastrian practice and would be um, presided over by the priest. The urine of a white, a healthy bull would be collected in a sacred vessel and then it would be drunk ritually and used for their kind of equivalent of wudu ritual ablutions. A lot of modern Zoroastrians say this is unhygienic, it spreads disease, it doesn't smell nice, we're not going to do this, we're going to use water instead. So when the Muslims come, many people seem to have had the same idea that this is actually better uh, and we're not interested in the authority of the priests any longer. And the basic practices of Islam, beautiful, simple, easy to understand. And the Zoroastrians are already praying five times a day. So in many ways the transition was not so great. And Islam seems to have been regarded by many, particularly the less fortunate in the, the uh, Zoroastrian system, as a liberation. Finally, um, Sayyidina Omar dies. 
uh, and uh, he dies tragically because he's assassinated. Uh, the historians recall, بَيْنَمَا كَانَ عُمَرَ بِنَ الْخَطَّابِ رضي الله عنه قائما يصلي صلاة الصبح while Umar ibn al-Khattab was standing praying his Fajr prayer in Medina طعنه أبو اللؤلؤ الثيروز أبو اللؤلؤ الثيروز stabbed him بسكين في كتفه he'd concealed a knife in his sleeve and while the Khalifa was praying he stabbed him and he stabbed him six times uh, and then tried to escape and the people tried to stop him but he had a knife and they didn't so he was able to kill several more people uh, in the process before turning the knife on himself and killing himself. So you could say that the practice of say suicidal terrorism or suicide bombing in Islamic history, the first case of anything like that is the killing of, of Hazrat Omar by Abu Lu'lu'a who kind of goes on this suicide mission and kills himself in the process. That's the beginning of it. Why did he do it? It seems that he was um, put up to it by some Persian conspirators who lamented the end of the Persian monarchy and did it as a kind of act of national revenge. But he's wounded and he takes a few days to die and before he dies he appoints a committee of six men including uh, Abu Ubaidah and Abi Ali ibn Abi Talib, great ones of the Sahaba, in order to get together to appoint his successors. And then his son Abdullah washes him and he dies at the age of 63 having ruled for 10 years and 6 months. And having really changed the face of the world from somebody who was uh, an enemy of Islam in his uh, early youth, he turns into a great hero of Islam, not just outwardly, a man who conquered the world, Egypt and Syria and Palestine and Iraq and Iran, parts of Central Asia, parts of much of the Caucasus, parts of India, extraordinary achievement, but had conquered himself so that his real concern was how he would be when he met his Lord, how he would uh, be called to account. He said, even if I heard that a dog died of hunger in Iraq, I would be afraid that my Lord would ask me about that. He took no pride in it. Instead, he was afraid because of all these responsibilities. So many people whose suffering, whose hunger and so forth could be attributed to him. And so he used to say, if only I were a leaf upon that tree despite the glory of what he'd achieved, his real glory was in his humility. A man of extraordinary power who became one of the masters of a great superpower still, so in control of himself, so masterful in his inward humility and his zuhud and his taqashuf and his real lack of interest in stuff of dunya that uh, he laid the foundations for the, for the great subsequent glory of Islam and all of those countries are Muslim to this day, with the exception of Palestine, whose confiscation is, as all serious historians looking at the patterns of history would agree, is merely temporary. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pour out his mercy upon Hazrat Omar ibn al-Khattab al farouq and grant him light in his grave and grant us to be inspired by him and not just to uphold the flag of Islam outwardly but also to be true Muslims in our souls. بارك الله فيكم والسلام عليكم والعفو منكم ورحمة الله وبركاته